Thank you again for uh, join, sticking around and uh, doing an afternoon session. Hopefully I'll be lively enough that you don't fall asleep after that lovely carb-filled lunch. Um, my name's Scott Shadley. I'm a storage technologist slash VP of marketing. I get to call myself a technologist because at one point in my career I was an engineer. You, don't, you can't blame me that I went for the frontal lobotomy to get my marketing hat. So. Uh, I work at NGD Systems. Uh, we're a pioneer in uh, computational storage. So today I'm going to give you an introduction to what we're doing, but more importantly, since this is a developer conference, I wanted to show real world examples of how we're using the technology today with customers. So yes, it's a tiny bit sales pitchy because I am a marketing guy, but I did want to make, uh, spend a lot of time more focused on what's causing the need for this. So uh, some examples of what's going on in the marketplace today. Uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, for the first time, they've determined it's actually hard to find a needle in a haystack. Uh, our data sets are growing to exponential sizes. We know that. We're getting exabytes, zettabytes of data as the kind of the video clip I was showing talks to. So what if we had a way that our storage devices, instead of just being like our storage lockers, we all rent from Stormore or U-Haul or whoever else we buy it, rent it from, and have to unload all the boxes to find the one box we need in the back of the storage room, could just have it pop out and walk out to us and you know, deliver itself to our house via an Uber or something. Um, so we worked with this company called Actual Tech Media. Some of you may know them. They asked this question of a, a slew of storage professionals, and where do you see the most storage performance bottlenecks? And so we talked, we got things like, I don't know, array controllers networking, but the biggest storage performance bottleneck is still, aha, the storage. And again, that's because we've done a lot in the market to improve on things. We've introduced things like NVMe. We've gone to things like the potential of open channel, open uh, everything. Uh, but at the same time, the storage device as a standalone product has not changed drastically from tape. We put bits on it, we pull bits off it, we don't do anything else with it. We may access it faster, we may have better reliability in the way of VCC, things like that, but we're not really moving the data around. We've done things like software to find everything, we're, we're moving to this whole new world, but at the end of the day, these slides are available, so I'm going to gloss over the, fun, the glossy stuff and get to the meat meat of it. The idea is don't leave the storage behind. There is opportunity to move compute into a storage device in an effective way that's easy to implement and also scales so that you're not dealing with just one added device. If I have 24 of these things, I'll show you what that can do to a system. And how does this uh, occur? Today's architectures look very much something like this. This is an example from one of our partners that uses, in this case, a very simple single CPU root complex with 16 lanes of traffic. They're going through a switch to get all of their SSDs and they're having a problem with the fact that they're needing to scale the capacity of this footprint, but they really don't want to change the compute architecture they're dealing with because the CPU side of things are more expensive, they're space constrained in their particular architectural environment. So as the devices get bigger and the, and the number of devices in a system, so we've got out there our friends at Supermicro with the EDSFF chassis that can support half a petabyte in one U, that's great, but now I have to figure out how to get access to all of that. And if I'm talking about this particular example where I've only got 16 lanes of traffic available and I'm switching it out, we see that the throughput capability of what the NAND can deliver and the flash can deliver over NVMe to the root complex is about a 50x or greater delta in performance speed. So I've got really, really fast I.O. over here and I've got a limited I.O. over there. I can switch through it, I can make it expand out, but at the end of the day, the number of gigabytes per second here versus the number of gigabytes per second there are drastically offset. So we need to work as an industry and an architecture to figure out how to solve or implement a way to make this solution a little more uh, opportunistic. Um, and it's not just us that are talking about it. So these are a bunch of different articles that have come out over the last several years. One of the bigger ones here from the IEEE conference, there was about 16 people that contributed to this concept of near data processing would be very valuable as a solution for us in the marketplace. A lot of this also plays into the edge and IoT space, and I'll explain how that works out as well. Uh, if we think about platforms that are going on the edge, we've got things like 5G, great, but we're still gonna run into bandwidth constraints. Moving data is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Storing is easy, we've got that down pat, we've got big drives, we've got NVMe, we've got all these other opportunities, but actually doing something with our data continues to be a, a significant struggle for us. So when we looked at it, we looked at the value props of this concept of computational storage. And of course, in our case, and what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is moving compute closer to the data. Now, in this particular instance, as I look at it from where I work and from what we're doing, it's at a drive level. 
This does not have to be just at a drive level. You've seen other presentations from our friends like Stephen Bates and other companies also in the marketplace that are going outside of just the drive level or looking at it at a system level. So there's lots of opportunity to do it. In this case, we're going to stay focused at what it is from a drive perspective. So a computation request by any application can be much more efficient if it's near the data. Uh, Greg Schultz from Storage.io wrote a blog article, the best I.O. is no I.O., the second best I.O. is the I.O. I only need. And that's kind of a, it fits very well into the vision statement of what computational storage is all about, L lessening the number of I.O.s. And when you talk about large data sets and even unstructured data, being able to do what you can at the data set location is much more valuable to you than having to constantly load, flush, and reload a DRAM footprint. So if I've got mega terabytes or exabytes of data sitting in a server, and I've only got a couple hundred gigabytes of DRAM, just simply doing the math of how many times I have to reload that DRAM footprint to scour that data should tell you that there's a lot of wasted time in today's architectures. So there's a great opportunity to uh, look at ways of l eliminating that and helping augment the CPU root complex. The techniques that we're talking about here are not in any way looking to replace a GPU. I'm not trying to get rid of an in-memory database. There are applications where what I do actually slow things down in the particular implementation, and I'll highlight those as we go through some of the case studies. What we're looking at here is something that you have stored needs to be analyzed. I'm going to make it faster to analyze that data through this concept of in-storage compute. So we, we took a, a dimensional look at this, and we said there's multiple different ways to do it, but we wanted to focus on things like the, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, again, I'm a marketing guy that used to be an engineer, so they have to really dumb it down for me to be able to communicate it to you as a bunch of folks. Um, so from an operating uh, system perspective, bare metal, real-time operating system, and it needs to be 64-bit OS. Those are pretty straightforward, simple dynamics. When we get to the hardware side of it, there's a lot of different opportunities. We started with 32-bit real-time processors. We talked about hardware acceleration. There's lots of opportunities there around ways we can use FPGA acceleration. And then uh, we decided to take the leap and say it needs to be 64-bit only. So for our particular platform, it's a 64-bit uh, operating platform. When you look at the user applications, we had to write firmware for this. This is something that has been looked at and been tried and had been presented by others earlier this week uh, in the way of using an existing storage device and these spare cycles in that controller or that platform to do these types of processes. They had issues with that because when you start having contention between compute and wear leveling, you can't fight. The wear leveling's got to take place. You've got to be able to keep the data intact. So we looked at it from that perspective. We're going to start from scratch, and we're going to write firmware from ground up that covers flash management, ECC, data placement, and then allow us to do things like add application software at the device level. In this case, we've actually been able to do virtualization via container. So Docker is my new best friend. Uh, and then uh, it seems to find out that talking to the number of customers that we have over the last couple of years, the AI application space, not just to use the buzzword, but just the way those applications work, on doing analytics in a storage environment fare very well for in-storage compute. If you're running inline in memory or doing stuff that requires you to access it as you see it before you store it, that's going to be somebody else's product in this particular instance. And in the future, we have the ability to do more true AI application acceleration. So right now, I'm just running the app in storage and actually giving you an acceleration out of that fact. Now, if we start rewriting the applications dedicated to these types of processes and products, we have a capability to do more with that. When it comes to looking at this as an ecosystem, there's a lot of things that can be done here. One of the things that we're working together with others in the industry, as was shown by the, the birds of feather last night, is the highest level of this and how this drive identifies itself to the system, how, what the API looks like that would drive this particular system. I have unique versions of those today because I have a new product in the market, if you will. But we're using the SNEA organization to help work through a, a provisional twig to actually develop some standardization on how these products are identified to the system so you know that it's my version of a product versus Steven's version of a product versus someone else's version of the product and be able to actually intelligently use an OS and not have to rewrite code every single time you want to use a different version of these particular products. So we call it in situ processing. Uh, in situ in Latin is in place. So we're not being very creative. Again, we're a small startup. Um, when you look at it from our perspective, uh, the CTO said when he sat down with the team, 
his number one focus was a seamless programming model. Back to this concept of keep it simple. If I can't make it easy for you to use, you're not going to touch it. So I have to start off with something very easy. Seamless is not easy, but it's as close as we can get to making it uh, functional. Scalability was another one. If you can't put this in process across multiple platforms with multiple people figuring out how to use it, you're never going to be able to actually implement this for a long-term solution. So scalability becomes very valuable. And then capacity growth. You need to make sure that whatever you're doing can support the capacity growth inside an individual drive. Right now we see a lot of problems today, not with people wanting bigger drives, but people being able to truly deliver a large drive at a reasonable cost with the right performance metrics. And those are another key cornerstone of what we're focused on. So this is the very basic block diagram of what computational storage is. I'm not taking the CPU out of the process. I'm simply adding compute processing into each and every one of my drives. So it scales. You add compute cores into the system and you augment the CPU or even free the CPU up to go do bigger and better things that are more useful with its time. Now, I've had a lot of questions in the room in previous conversations. What about things like open channel? Open channel is taking a lot of the control of this drive out into the CPU. That's not what this product's designed for. I can make you an open channel SSD if that's what you like and you want to go write your own FTL. But if you take the FTL out of my drive, you lose the capability to do in storage compute. So there are definitely trade-offs in the market and there are customers that are saying, we don't like that idea. There's customers saying, we really like that idea. So I just want to be very open as far as the development perspective. This does require you to have the drive act as a traditional NVMe target. So when we think about moving compute to data, this is going to be a, a history lesson for most people in the room. So you write data in, it comes into the storage device, we read it out of the storage device into DRAM, that particular path, and then using the host CPU to do the compute, that's the focus of in-storage compute or what we call in-situ processing because you're going to sit there and repeat that process multiple times over again with multiple drives in multiple systems. And if we have the ability to limit the number of times you have to use that host CPU and the time it requires to offload the entire storage device into the host DRAM, we're going to be able to show you how we can save time and money. So with an in-situ storage device, we do the same thing. We're going to store your data. So again, this is back to the point, I'm not an in-memory platform. I'm not going to do things real-time. I'm going to do near real-time. Once it's in the data storage device, you now have your internal buffers, which in our case is a drive with DRAM on, on board. And we have computational resources in the way of ARM cores outside of the NVMe data path. So the data management of the read and write still takes place. We use an alternative path to be able to process the data in place. The type of in-situ processing that we offer, it's an embedded Linux platform. So you don't have to worry about having a specific app. If it can run an ARM64, it can basically be dropped into the drive. And we offer APIs and solutions to help support that capability. Then the results are fed back and you're getting a smaller packet size out of the drive. You're limiting the I.O. and you're freeing the DRAM and CPU to go do other things while you're running your storage compute. Yes, and please, if you have questions, stop me because I tend to ramble pretty quick and we'll be done really, really fast. So when you are doing that process towards being more So data contention, if you will, from that example. So uh, yeah, the question in the room was, if I'm doing in-situ processing on data in the drive and you go and do write and update the data, what happens to that situation? Because we're always reading stored data, it's as if you were doing the same thing where you're writing to a drive as you're exiting out into host DRAM. There is a potential for contention or for processing on old data. Since I'm not doing it within the, me the memory buffer as it's going in, you have exactly the same contention example as you would just point it into the host system. We don't have an overlap issue from that perspective. Yes? How much extra DRAM do you need for in-situ processing? And how many extra cores do you need for processing? He's asking for the block diagram. I like it. <laughs> Um, our in-situ processing is built on A53. We have uh, four 64-bit ARM cores. And from a DRAM buffer perspective, we're not using more than about two to four gigabytes of DRAM depending on the size of the drive. So that's extra two to four gigabytes? On top of the standard amount we have for the drive processing. So we, I'll show you in a bit. We do have patents related to the DRAM on the NVMe side, which limit that footprint requirement of space on the drive as well. Yes. So in terms of the capability of that uh, process, what kind of processing is like encryption or compression or 
what kind of sort of process in your mind? The, the beauty is, this is effectively the way we've designed this drive. It's a micro server in a drive. It's got a runtime Linux OS on the drive. You can drop any application. So encryption, we've already done with the customer. Compression, we've done with the customer. It's running as an application in the drive. It's not a compression engine inside the drive. And so, so even more flexible than like yeah. FPGA. I'll show six different ways we've already done things with customers as part of my kind of real world examples. Yes? Yes, yeah, so our choice for our general distribution is a Ubuntu 16.04 core, where they've stripped out all the drivers for everything like external peripherals and displays and stuff like that. So it's a very small footprint, full-fledged Linux OS. Yes, it is a real-time operator. It, it, it boots up just like a server would It'd be running a natural server. Effectively, what our drive does is that, that Linux OS looks at the NAND placements as if they're like drives in a system. Yeah. So, and for our, the purposes of this product, we can run Ceph or we can run any other operating system as the core operating system. Just for our development platform and our release product, it's Ubuntu. Yeah. So no, there's definitely options. Uh, another way to answer the question is to say, well, how does 60 megabytes compare to how much you said you got two gigabytes or yeah. eight gigabytes of RAM? Well, then, then it's time. Exactly. Yes, sir. They run Docker containers. You can literally write any algorithm you like, and they can run it down there. Um, so, Scott, I, I think I have two questions. One is, is there a concept of networking? So, if I'm running on this Ubuntu operating system on those A57s, do I see like a network interface that I can use to talk to the outside world? Or is that something that's not available to me? So, that's kind of one. And then the other is, you mentioned that, we, that, that the operating system sees this, the flash media as some kind of device. Can you elaborate a little more on what, how it's presented to the OS? Like how, if I have an algorithm that wants to look for the largest value across these die, how, yeah. how does that look? So the, the A53 cores utilize the M7 data path. We talk to and pull data from the drive as if it's working through this as a pseudo host. So the d direct connection between those two is an arm-to-arm -arm NAND flash interface, so it's much faster than even the PCIe Gen 3 bus. So even though I have a smaller footprint, a smaller DRAM, my application processors I chose for power versus performance, an A73 or A74 would be much faster, but the power budget trade-off wasn't worth it for what I'm dealing with within the storage device itself, because I'm talking 8, 16, 32, maybe 64 terabytes of data, not petabytes of data behind those cores. And the amount of time I save transferring across that bus, as I hope to show you in a minute, um, <laughs> highlight the capabilities of the A53 being more than powerful enough to support that. To your other question around network capability, for this connection to this uh, migrated application or host processor, we do run a small host API that uses a TCP connection over the NVMe protocol. So there's been a conversations here about NVMe over TCP IP. I'm already doing it the other way around. So every drive has a pseudo IP address that I can see from my host side, and I can address all of those devices in system, which also allows it to extrapolate over a fabric-based platform, and we're working with a couple of fabrics guys. Yeah, and, and it'll still be fast. Yes, sir. So uh, crawl, walk, run. Crawling is where we're at today as a startup. So we have individual devices. Walk is peer-to-peer. -peer. Run is where I eliminate his problem of hopping, hopping, hopping. So yes, today it's just individual devices. But because they run concurrently and or simultaneously, I may be re redundantly running an application within multiple drives and getting the similar results. There's not going to be the exact same data file on any drive that I'm looking for, or shouldn't be if you're a good storage architect you're going to be spreading your data across it, so your results will come back concurrently. What is the package? Uh, how much is the package? How much is the what? The power. So 
We designed this to be a low power solution. So at 16 terabytes and a two and a half inch U.2, full data rate and running application, it's 12 watts. So we have the lowest watt per terabyte available on a drive today. Yes, and then I'll get you. What's the ballpark of the adding the cost for SSDs? Ah, there we go. All right, I did not pay him for that one. Um, so we looked at it from that perspective. There is a, a, what we classify as a licensing cost for the support of the in-situ platform to support that. It's in the order of, on the order of magnitude of pennies per gigabyte above a standard SSD product. So we do it, we, uh, we do it in both a monthly, yearly, or lifetime type of a license fee. And because we know some customers like the idea of having a very large, very low power drive as a standalone product, we can sell it as a storage device and be competitive in the market with any other big guys because we're just going to buy their NAND. And our bomb is less than their bomb outside of the NAND. So we offset a lot of the what we considered assumed cost. And uh, then we can add on the computational resources. So it's an on-off switch capable product. You can buy it with or without. And you can turn it on later if you want to. Yes? Going in, you said there's no overlap, but you're going to have how much, uh, what is the limitation on your uh, on-device compute? And I have to ask me the latency, I can't finish the compute. If I actually have the application set up at all, I need to know to write, because there's object. Is there any mechanic adding, or there's like a feedback or application? So, so based on the way that we're doing this, it's, it's not a high write performance product, and we give read as a standalone NVMe, it's three gigabyte per second read, one gig write. It's not a high, it's not designed to be a three gig, three gig. And we read prioritize everything. So if a write's coming in, we'll actually stall the read and, or the write in favor of finishing the reads, even if it's from the application processor. Yeah. All right. Oh, I'm gonna hate that slide later. Um, so we look at it from a perspective of today's SSD and I have a long-standing debate with people inside the company of the use of animation. As you can tell, I think they won today. <laughs> um, so you have the idea of a smart SSD with in-situ processing, gives you abundant resources inside the SSD. We've added those cores to give that to you where others haven't had it in the past. Because we are running a virtualized platform with a 64-bit application processor, we create this concept of a disruptive trend in the marketplace within storage compute. Um, this slide I will not take credit for. One of our partners that helped present this for us at some of this material at FMS created the slide, and this was their interpretation of what in storage compute can do for the marketplace. So solutions. This is the fun part. My first one, that previous slide was from our friends at Microsoft Research. They were kind enough to get on stage with us at FMS a couple months ago. So this is a little more detail than we were able to present there because it was a much shorter session. Basically what we're doing with them is they use this tool from Facebook called the AI Similarity Search. It takes images, converts them to three-dimensional vector identifiers, X, Y, Z, effectively, stores them on disk, and then does comparisons of those. So it's an inference, uh, utilizes an approximate, ne approximate nearest neighbor neural network. And uh, up into 2017 with a billion images, their current platforms, they just threw more compute at it. So it's more storage, more compute, keep throwing servers. We're starting to run into power problems. And now, with 2019 coming along, the concept of a trillion images in a single data set is becoming more challenging for these guys. So the premise of this is you're going to Bing. You go to the image search on Bing, and you say, I want to see cats. And you want to see how many cats it can come back with. And we're all real-time people, so how fast can I get those cats back? Google used to put 0000012 to show you how fast they were responding. That number is creeping the other way because they can't see all the files as efficiently as they want. So by way of working with us in this concept of doing queries inside the system, I start with a balloon, I get balloons out. Now I'm not finding the same image and I'm not trying to. That's not the purpose of this particular app. They use various different platforms. So this tool is an open source application that multiple different companies use, including Microsoft in this case. So they, how their architecture is put together, there's multiple ways they do it too. And we talked to them about that as well, but um, that's not the premise here is more just about the app and what we can do with the application. 
So if you look at the way the, the tool set's built today, it uses what we're all used to seeing. You load a training set, you index it, you have to reload the database, and if you add a new file, you have to add it back to the database. These are all multiple steps that go back and forth between storage and host processor. So this is, the, uh, this is an example of one way they put it together. This is not by any means the only CPU structure you can use. But what we're doing here from a storage, in storage compute perspective is as the file's written, we're able to in, automatically update the index already on the drive. We're able to create and modify the database, and then we're able to run the inference real time on it. So it takes milliseconds of time to do all that work versus seconds of time to get it done in the quote unquote real world. So as we put this in actual numbers with our customer, and they called it an intelligent SSD just to give reference. I didn't want to modify his slide. Um, with just running the system on the host, he was averaging from a queries per second or the metric of this particular application, just shy of 500 queries per second. With 16 drives in the system, which he already needs to hold the size of the database in that platform, by turning on the in-situ processing, he got a 4x improvement with no modifications to the app, and all we did was port his existing application into all 16 drives and run them concurrently for him. Yes? So uh, all these SSD you're referring to here, is, uh, you do the two NVMe SSD? Yes, there are U.2 NVMe SSDs. They're all, in this case, for this particular example, they were eight terabytes apiece. And they were fully loaded, all 16 drives fully loaded with eight terabytes of image database. So it's, it's, we utilize the arm to arm communication. So sorry, the question was what do we use for internal bandwidth between application and NAND? Uh, since we're talking arm to arm, we're using the native uh, interface there. It runs around 16 gigabytes per second. You know, to be honest, I don't know the specifics of it. I asked not to because then I end up divulging IP to a room full of people. <laughs> yes? One confusion I have is that when in the software-defined storage systems, the images um, from the client systems come as I upload as a Facebook user an image, it finally hits the storage as a shard. Yes. It's a piece of that image. It's like it's not the entire image and it perhaps goes through some transport. The individual SSD will see the full images and you can index things or is that artificial or is that real use case? This is how the face tool by converting that image into a three-dimensional vector. That vector is a much smaller footprint. It's a, it's a couple kilobytes per file. So I'm not actually sharding the physical image. I'm re -re I am re-representing the image in this case through that vector. So it's a different implementation. There are applications like that that I cannot accelerate. So there are limitations to what we can do. In the cases for what we've done so far today, everything's a direct attach, and the files are intact but spread across multiple drives. There's no RAID cards involved either because RAID virtualizes out my drives. So did Microsoft, I know this is maybe a little bit off the topic, did Microsoft, you have indexing your earlier slide, did they run anything like Apache Spark or Lucene or any of the more standard indexing tools? That are related to uh, I don't know exactly what the premises are. They're going to be presenting the final results of this at a technical conference in December. So, and it'll be public record. And there's a bunch of this is already public on their site. It's called the Microsoft Soft Flash Research Project. S O F T F L A S H. Did I get everybody's hands? So, this is queries per second. This is what makes the application guy happy. So we also thought about, well, what about other ways to look at the way this analysis can be done? Because i got to find TCO. i got to make other customers happy. This is processing time. So not only can I do queries per second, but how long does it take to get the processing done? Same 16 drives, host in orange, host plus my drives in blue. If we take a closer zoom in, oh, did I not put the zoom in on this one? I probably didn't. Um, so if you look all the way down here, you'll see that if I'm one drive to one host in this particular instance, this application is actually slower running in situ on my drive because the database is not big enough and the host is that much faster because it all fits into DRAM. But as you scale up to 16 drives, two things happen. One, the amount of time it takes to process, to move the data for processing into the host goes up. And then you can see if we went beyond 16, it's literally an exponential curve. No matter how big the database gets, and no matter how many drives I add, my results are consistent and stable. Is, is there any meaning that like around five or six cores, it's a, a wash? Is there any way to kind of like make a rule of thumb out of that? 
this is, so this result will be unique to every application you run. So for this application, when you hit host plus four, I just saved you four servers, is the best way to look at that. Because you don't have to have those extra servers in place to support that. Because if I do host plus 16, I'd have to throw, basically to get from 42 seconds back down to half a second, how many CPU cores and new, new servers do I have to add? At four, it's four, at 16, it's about 26 servers is what we figured out based on the way that this particular platform is built. If you have higher performance processors, more cores, all that kind of stuff, this math will change. So this is definitely a, a point in the sand, if you will, uh, or a line in the sand, if you will, of this particular app. When you played a slide, when you said the performance is 4x, was that sustained? Yes. That is sustained. Do you have actual numbers? Do you have like 4x times? Because it depends how fast the drive that you were using. Hey. Valid point. In this particular instance, this is the same data just represented differently. These are all our drive, and they are based on our prototype FPGA solution. Our ASIC-based solution will shoot even more of a delta to that system because our, our ASIC-based solutions are actually a, a faster processing drive. So, and the, like I said, the research project will be publicized by Microsoft when it's final. The current target's December. Yes. Why is the search time increasing super linearly with respect to number of drives? From our perspective? No, from or the unconventional uh, drives. From the perspective in this case, it's just because every time we increase the, num the drive, we're adding eight terabytes to the database as well. And so that eight terabytes has to be moved from host, from DRAM, or into DRAM. And so you're scaling it at eight terabytes per step, basically. So it takes that much longer to use the amount of DRAM, in this case 32 gigabytes of DRAM, to do that large of a data set through 32 gigabytes of DRAM, it just takes longer. So, um, so I mentioned we can also use this type of technology at the edge. Um, so this particular instance, um, this is how we used to find images. So if I wanted to find his face in this slew of things, I'd have to start somewhere, or I can use an AI, AI algorithm to find them in one and then I have to figure out where the timestamp matches in another. Um, we actually had some fun with the video clip and now it's not gonna play for me, right? Um, so this is showing three individual cameras directly connected to each of the individual drives, so it's a one-to-one -one relationship. You can see that we're tracking the image but we're slightly off because this is near real time. I'm storing the image, doing the object analysis, and then sending that result to the host. The relevant example for this particular case is 60 frame rates per second input. I'm about 2.25 frames slower in my response time. That's why you see a slight shift in some of the boxes. But I'm not losing the image, and I can track from, Im from camera to camera. So the customer we're working with in this particular instance wants to set up a chassis of 24 drives with 24 cameras in a circle, and have someone walk around the room, and our drives can keep track of that person and report back to the host while the host sits idle. That's in storage compute in an edge style application. Stephen was kind enough to point out the concept of a container. So this is called Open ALPR. We literally took that and dropped it straight from the Docker container store for ARM into the drive. You can see that it's an IP address that goes into our individual device. And we're executing this license plate recognition application inside the drive. The host is, is again, sitting idle in this particular instance. So right now, he's basically clicking on an image to get that result back in the confidence level. Native app, no changes to the platform. We just wrapped a GUI around it. In this case, we're gonna upload a brand new image from a different drive into the existing drive that we're talking about as a standard, I'm uploading a picture. And then he's gonna go ahead and send it in. It's gonna get added to the database, and then it can be, again, recognized by this particular application. So you have four A53 cores, right? Yes. In this case, it's designed for 64-bit ARM, that particular app, so we could drop it right in. If there's not a native ARM 64-bit, then it would not be able to do that. Look, let me ask the question differently. To do this demo, did you use one core or four? It utilized all four. Yep. And I kept that picture because, you know, we're all developers. We like our vodka. So that's an example of, of being able to run a container inside the drive with no changes or modifications to the platform. And again, this is just that app running in place on the drive 
acknowledging and, and being able to read this. So it doesn't matter what the container is, I could grab a different app. We've done things with TensorFlow as well that we've uh, shown in some of the instances. Um, so outside of this, we then started thinking, well, what about if we go into the space of uh, our friends in biotech? Because I got to be friendly to a lot of different people. Um, Blast is an application that's doing protein sequencing based on files in various different places and our different file sizes. This particular graphic shows across here the number of cores in the system. Here shows the number of drives with the in situ processing turned on. And this is the percent improvement as you add drives to the system or as the database grows. So I, I made a little animation of the slides to show you that as you build it out, you can see that you continue to see an improvement as the database goes up, but it sits somewhat idle. But as my database grows and I use more of my drives and more of my storage, the shift of how much performance gain I get just by turning on the in situ cores inside the storage I already have is about 100% improvement. Yes? To what extent do you have, are you CPU limited on these drives versus you know, the back end flash interaction? Do you have any, like, you, know, you just showed a whole bunch of applications, right? Did you, are you bound by, you know, could you throw a lot more cross in there? We could, yes. So it was, it was a conscious trade-off to look at a reasonable processor that still gives me benefit for an existing architecture versus going for 100% acceleration. Yeah. Uh, a trade-off, if I went to the A7 class of uh, application processors or put more of them in there, my 12 watts per drive goes up. Sure. And then I start becoming uncompetitive from an SSD only perspective. Yes? So if I wanted to upgrade or patch that you uh, uh, Ubuntu embedded OS, how, how painful for that the process is? How long it take? Um, it's all done through our software API. I don't have the specific details on that, but I can certainly follow up with you on it. it we support upgrade path through our, our host API. It's able to push software updates to the drive. Do we need a reboot as a host? No. For this kind of, no? It doesn't require a reboot. Because at the, at the level that we deliver the drive, that embedded Linux and that whole processing capability is shadowed from the customer. You don't actually know that it's there as far as the drive being plugged into the system. It's just executing the applications on your behalf. So do you expose any your vendor specific uh, NVMe or the main command to let the host that can manage this embedded OS, anything there? Today, we don't open that option to customers because that creates a lot more support requirements. If you change something just wrong, it breaks the IP, the rest of the IP in the system. We are working to, v to build a developer kit version of it that would allow users to have more access to the internal aspects of that processing. The total internal slash bandwidth available. And you may have answered this question. I have. So the, the NAND itself is run, we're, at, we're agnostic since we don't make it. We can run on for your toggle, so we run at those interface speeds. Whatever the NAND choice is, our net performance relatively the same because there's not enough difference between those. Can you give us a ballpark? I think the current NAND interface is like 400 megatransfers per second, is how they quote it. Right, but so. across all the channels. Uh, we're using a 16 channel controller in all of our different versions. It's a, the last I checked, we were around 16 gigabytes per second just at that interface per channel. 16 gigabytes per channel. This might be a hard question to answer, but um, did your CTO or somebody that designed the chip say that, okay, if we're controlling 8 terabytes of NAND and we have four A53 64 bit cores, is that a good like mix as opposed to saying, Let's just put two cores on there, or eight cores. The, the four was a solid balance. They, spent, they, they went anywhere from two to 16. They were thinking of doing a core per channel, for example. And the, between a gate count limitation inside of an ASIC and or FPGA, and the performance characteristics gain you get, it made sense to do four as the first point for this particular iteration. Yes? So adding these four cores, does that uh, add any like uh, cooling concerns, these thermal ch challenges? So because my entire drive runs at 12 watts in a U.2, I actually have less thermal constraints than a lot of the drives on the market today that are running at 25 watts. I don't add substantial thermal in the way that this particular solution is designed today. So it doesn't get in the way. In fact, I'm saving thermal budget at the CPU level in the host because the host is not actually running or it's off doing something else. So I'm going to skip my nasty slide that keeps transitioning on me and go straight to this one. 
So when we, so this is kind of the nuts and bolts of everything we did. So we had to start with a new ASIC. So we did design an ASIC device. It's a 14 nanometer SSD controller that has those A53 cores embedded. Single SOC, there's no two part build to this particular platform. So you get your NVMe SSD with the compute on the side if you want it, or you can just run it as an NVMe drive. We weren't about to put it in anything but the standard form factor. So you get your U.2, your M.2, your EDSFF, and if you really want size, I have an add-in card that can support over 100 terabytes. Um, we had to make sure the management of the product was correct, so we wrote the firmware and algorithms around reliability of the NAND from ground up. We have about 12 different patents on the various versions of ECC, LDPC, and error recovery, including one that allows for the drive to have failed devices removed, replaced, and rebuilt in the, as a field replaceable upgrade module. And then we wrote the firmware, and we focused on things like QoS. So this is your 5.9 window for my FPGA-based product, let alone my ASIC product, which is going to shrink that. I will call out this is a very good marketing slide because I make it look like we're really cool right in the middle of the other guys. This red window actually sits in the time scope ahead of my drive. I'm not faster than they are. I'm more consistent than they are. And half the customers I talk to will take that consistency today over the speed of the response. And that's with computation running while doing I.O. to the drive. Then on top of all that, we put in the in-situ platform. So the in-situ platform, to kind of recap, has hardware accelerators on side of the uh, ARM cores, has the full-fledged, in this case, Ubuntu. Again, we can run other OSs if desired. And we added the Docker container capability to the solution. Going into VMware, especially with now ARM being supported, is a potential for us. So at the end of the day, it looks something about like this. Proprietary controller, so yes, I am another controller vendor. No, I'm not gonna sell you a controller. I will sell you a drive in various different form factors or variants, but I'm not gonna sell you a controller. And all these different form factors. As I mentioned here, the AIC shows up to 64. With QLC, I can do 128. So for us, finding the needle faster, Having the in-situ processing as a core <coughs> tenant of what we're up to, that's what we call computational storage today. It's all about near data processing. We're moving the compute closer to the data. We're getting as close as we humanly possibly can at this point by putting it inside the ASIC on the drive. There are absolutely other ways to do near data processing, and there's absolutely ways this is not going to solve your problem. So keep that in mind. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we found people that can actually use it today and help the rest of us figure it out. So having the weight of Microsoft Research has been a great blessing to us. We did have to do the flash agnostic controller. It does support TLC and QLC today. We've uh, already characterized early QLC parts from one of our vendors, and we can get half a drive write per day on a full line write, one gigabyte per second write to QLC with our uh, flash management algorithm. Yes, absolutely. We have friends in the marketplace. So Steven's sitting a couple chairs over from you. He just is shaking his head. He has a very a various version of in situ. Uh, my, my friend that's hiding in the market around here somewhere and not presenting today has another solution that's based on a host-based FTL that can run this type of thing. They run compute and storage, but they use a host-managed drive. So they're not an NVMe target. They're a block storage target. So they're a similar. They're as close to what we're doing as, as we have in the marketplace as a, a like product. So where ours is a standalone, theirs is host-based. In the back. Uh, the, the part of the, the, the application I'm wondering, uh, particularly like the example you showed for the camera tracking images, you mentioned that you're going to store images anyway, which basically means you have to give the main system memory anyway. In that case, is it because you're secure itself? Because I have to pay the cost of in memory anyway. Right. The data is already there, then I'm going to do a, probably read a kind of computation there. Right. But if it's kind of straining the data, it's adding it going through the system memory. Uh, do you guys have anything? We're, we're focused on in storage. So in the example with the, the cameras, it's a lot more about post-processing than it is real-time processing. So I'm not going for in-memory or real-time data management where it's sitting in memory first. I have to store the bits first, whether it's video image, file, whatever the case may be, our product requires it to be stored and then pulled back into application processors. 
That's a, just a, a choice from our perspective. Yes, right here. How about the measuring and all that from the flash? Is it taken care by the uh, flash simulated FPS? Yes. So the question was, where level leveling garbage collection, the standard NVMe stuff? That's managed by the NVMe half of our drive, which is a separate ARM core, which is designed for that, which is the M class. The A class processors are only for application execution. Yeah, so um, the question was, um, does there come a point where networks and internet uh, interconnects are so fast that off storage uh, can do actually makes more sense? We sort of double. And with reduced latency, there must come a point where it doesn't make sense to do this inside the uh, storage. Area. If you're looking to do it when it's it, anything that's a stored bit, if you have to move it off of that into some host memory base that is not of like size, I'll still have an acceleration factor. Yes, you can make it faster and you have other ways to offload it. You can offload it to multiple systems. But if I've got 100 gig to one petabyte, I'm still going to be faster in some way. The, the acceleration value will definitely drop. No. In fact, we're capable of doing a Gen Z interface on our devices if we wanted to. So these are enterprise class drives. There is power loss protection built into every single one of the drives. Our, one thing I didn't specifically call out because I don't want to put too much IP on the thing. Uh, our DRAM footprint, we use a thing called Elastic FTL. It's a homegrown FTL that requires less than the traditional one gigabyte to one terabyte that most controllers use today. I use one gigabyte to control eight terabytes. So that way I have the room for the DRAM I need in my application processors, and I still use less total DRAM than any other drive of my like capacity. So your power loss protection will ensure that... Both the application down. DRAM and the, D, the, the user DRAM are protected. The, the paradigm here is post-processing paradigm, but uh, the streaming, live streaming, uh, if you wanted to process the data before storing, could this uh, architecture do it or not? This architecture, no. His architecture, yes. I'll be honest. That There are so many different ways to do this type of architecture. We're absolutely focused on in-storage compute. I'd love to do both, but you got to start somewhere. So, Any other questions? Yeah, very early. Yes, in the back. Look at an application, let's say you said daily with a haystack. So I'm wondering like what runs in the XA or main CPU? What runs in your ARM code? And are there any industry standards required to connect that? How easy is it to partition applications around? So we use a host-based FTI or API library that you use as your point as your storage target, and then it pushes the application, a copy of the application into all the different drives. And the CPU is sitting idle waiting for the application response from storage. We're faking it out effectively by only sending up the results and sending the whole data set back. So there's still some further po quote unquote post processing required by the CPU, but it's substantially less. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I can't thank you enough for making standing room only. Hopefully, this was very informative for you guys.